Good morning. Can everybody hear me? Perfect. Happy Father's Day. Yes. Oh, yes. I made so many mental notes to say this. If there are any parents who would like to send their kids to Sunday school, now is the time to do that. Let's pray together as we begin. Lord God, I thank you that though the anger of man, even the efforts of man, do not produce the righteousness that belongs to you, yet you give us your righteousness. You give us wisdom from above. I thank you that you're generous, that you give wisdom to all who ask. So we ask you today that you would give them that wisdom which is pure and holy, that you would give us the wisdom to walk in humility, that you would give us understanding from your word, that you would help us to have the strength to follow you and the wisdom to evaluate ourselves. Lord, thank you for fathers. Thank you for the wisdom you gave my father. Thank you for the wisdom you're willing to give all fathers who look to you and ask. Thank you that we can be here this morning. Thank you for your word. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to do something a little different for Father's Day. I don't want to preach to you about how to be a father with my three years of experience. And <laughs> Rather than explaining some verse about fathers or appreciating the fathers in general, I just want to share with you something my father shared with me. So rather than explain what it means to honor your father, I'd like to honor my own father today and share with you something, a couple things that he shared with me. Two things, uh, more than anything else. You know, it's funny what we remember from fathers. Some of us have selective memories. The Israelites only remembered the good stuff in Egypt. I'm not sure how that works. They only remembered the bad stuff about God. I'm not sure how that works. So some of us, we have bad memories of fathers. Maybe because we have bad fathers, maybe because we have bad memories. Some of us remember good things, some of us remember bad things. I don't know where you're all at, but I know that God blessed me tremendously with a wonderful father. And so I believe all of the gifts he gives us, he gives us so that we can use it to build up the church. So I want to share two things that he shared with me. I remember them better than anything else that he ever shared with me. The first one, he taught me to read the Bible and believe it. He said, you don't need someone to explain it to you. It means what it says. And so as soon as I learned to read, and I was the firstborn, so I learned to read at four, he got me a Bible and said, start reading this. Just believe it. And he never, he never walked through it with me. We didn't have Bible studies together. He didn't explain what this verse meant or what that verse meant. Um, you know, he was always available to answer questions, but he didn't actually try to explain the Bible. He just gave it to me, and he trusted God that it would make sense. So every day, he'd come home, and he'd ask me, so what did you learn in the Bible? I remember some days, I would see him come home, and I would feel ashamed because I knew, oh yeah, I forgot to read the Bible today. And I know, as soon as I see my dad, he's going to ask me, so what did God teach you? And some days, if God didn't teach me anything, he would just remind me, you know, God's willing to teach you. Ask him. And you'll have days where it feels like you're learning nothing. Trust him. He'll teach you in his time. I remember one morning I got up really early and I read through all of Isaiah before my dad got up. And he asked me, what did you learn? I was so proud of myself until that moment. It was about God, I think. <laughs> I don't know, it was kind of confusing. <laughs> he taught me, uh, you know, don't read the Bible for the sake of it. You read the Bible to hear from God. So that's the first thing he taught me. The second thing, I, I say that all as preface because the second thing is really what I want to talk about today. My dad was raised nominally Catholic. He vaguely knew the Bible. He believed there was a God. He believed the Bible was true. And he knew he was a sinner and he knew what happened to sinners in the end. But he basically believed that you could be saved if you were just a good enough person. And it wrecked years of his life. So my dad, other than sharing that the Bible made sense, there was one thing he wanted to make sure I understood from the Bible and that I was thinking about it from a young age. And that's, are you saved by what you do or are you saved by Jesus? 
Now, what I'm going to share with you about that, I didn't get from my dad mostly. I got from the Bible. But because he had me thinking about it so young, even though you can tell by the look on my face, I'm just some young and I don't know nothing. Because of my dad, I've been thinking about this issue biblically for over 20 years. Because he cared about it, and he passed that concern on to me. I'll start with why it's important, what happens if you go wrong. Talk about why it's difficult, and then we'll look at two passages that address it. If you get this wrong, there's two ditches you can fall into. On the one hand, you can conclude your works, what you do, are what save you. And once you decide that, you have two options. Either you can set the bar way up here and realize, I'm never going to be good enough. Look at Jesus. Oh my, he was a good guy. I'm never going to be like that. Look at Paul. Look at Peter. Look at Pastor so-and-so. Look at my friend Billy. Like, whoever it is, you, you go, I'm not that good. I've sinned, and there's nothing I can do to make up for that. It'll lead you to despair. Or you'll have fits of despair and fits of trying really hard where you grit your teeth and go, I was bad yesterday, but from now on, from now on, I'm not going to sin. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be the best husband. I'm going to be the best dad. And then, you, you know, you go on for two weeks trying really hard and nothing's working. You're still angry in your mind. You still are just frustrated with this, that, or the other thing. And then you give up and you're in despair again. Some of the greatest uh, figures in church history, some of the most influential people who have ever shaped the church, they grew to care about the things of God because they spent years in that state going back and forth. John Wesley, who had a big influence in starting this church way back when, he tried so hard to please God by trying hard. In school, him and his buddy George Whitfield, they would read over the Bible verse by verse. They wouldn't eat for days. They'd pray over every verse in Greek and do everything they possibly could only to find that their heart was still full of sin. How could they ever be good enough for God when the Bible says even the angels hide their faces. Even the angels are dirt to him. Even the angels he owes nothing to. So you can set the bar really high and it'll ruin your life with despair and fits of trying really hard. Maybe you eventually will give up. The other way you can ruin yourself, instead of putting the bar really high up here, you just put the bar somewhere more manageable. Maybe you'll say, well, the bar is, I just have to be a little bit better than the guy in the pew over. The bar is, you know, as long as I'm above average, maybe you're a real go-getter. As long as I'm better than the pastor, I'm in. You know, I'm sure he's in, so as long as I'm better than him, you know, I spend more time in the Bible and I give more money to the poor than the pastor does. I don't got a thing to worry about. I'm playing it safe. Maybe you set the bar really low. As long as I come to church, I'm pretty sure I'm in. Look at the pagans. Hitler didn't go to church, did he? So I know I'm in, as long as I'm better than Hitler. You set the bar wherever you want. The other ditch is to say what you do has nothing to do with whether or not you're saved. God doesn't care what you do. And so you spend your life doing whatever you want. The Bible says friendship with the world is enmity with God. And you go, well, yeah, yeah, no, but I'm saved, so it's all good. I can, be, I can have an enmity with God, and in the end, he'll forgive me. We're buds. These two ditches, on the one side, deciding that your works save you. On the other side, deciding God doesn't care about your works. You can be saved without him. This is a difficult issue in the Bible. It's one that Christians have argued about for ages. It shouldn't be difficult. It's everywhere in the Bible. It's... Um, laid out plainly many times. But consider this. Two questions. In Mark, a man comes up to Jesus, Mark 10, and he says, what must I do, good teacher, to inherit eternal life? And in Acts, somebody comes to the apostles and they say, what must I do to be saved? What do the apostles say? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. What does Jesus say? You know the commandments. 
That's his answer, isn't it? Aren't those different answers? They're, aren't they the same question? The same question, different answers. How can that be? On the one hand, we're told, believe in Jesus and you'll be saved. On the other hand, when Jesus is asked, what must I do? He says, you know the commandments. Don't murder, don't lie, don't steal, don't commit adultery. How does this work? In my wrestling with this over the years, I sometimes would conclude works had nothing to do with anything, but we we're just going to serve God anyway. And then you come to a passage where it, it, it seems a bit odd. The holiness, it says in Hebrews, there's a holiness without which no one will see God. There's many passages, if you think your works have nothing to do with anything, they just rub you the wrong way. You go, why, Jesus? Why did you answer him that way? Were you trying to confuse us? Just say, believe, Jesus. Why did you bring up works when he asked what I must do? Why did you give him stuff to do? Why didn't you say, do? Are you crazy? There's no do. <laughs> Look at two passages to address this. How do works and faith fit together? And I hope that as we go through them, the answer will become quite clear. I'll preface this quickly. Both of these passages are going to be using er er Eridon? Abraham <laughs> as a paradigm. In the Old Testament, Abraham is deliberately set up as the paradigm of a faithful Israelite. In Genesis 15, we have the first instance of the word believe in the Bible. Often the Bible is intentional where it puts the first word. They don't, God gives them his name in Exodus 3. It, it's careful. Abraham has showed faith before. In chapter 14, Abraham, he brought out an army of just 318 men, and he took on an army that involved 14 kings and all their armies. Well, nine kings. There were 14 fighting each other, but it doesn't really matter. I probably counted them wrong. You go count it yourself. That takes faith. He took over all the lands. And the king of Sodom comes out to him and says, Abraham, keep the spoils. Give back my men. Abraham knows, as the victor, he has the right to all the spoils. It's like he took over Saskatchewan or something. All, all the money in swift current is his now. And he says, I've lifted up my hand to the Lord. Keep everything. I, I'm keeping nothing. I'm just ta I'll take enough food for my army. That's it. That takes tremendous faith. That takes tremendous doing. Chapter 12, Abraham's told, go from the land of your fathers to the land that I will show you. In Hebrews we read, he went out not knowing where he was going because it wasn't until he got there that God said, look around, this is the land. Abraham had tremendous faith before chapter 15, but it's only in chapter 15 we realize Abraham believed God and God accredited it to him as righteousness. The Bible leaves off the word faith until that chapter because in that chapter, I told Ben we wouldn't do Old Testament, but let's just turn there quickly. What does Abraham do in that chapter? If, you're, if God counts your faith as righteousness, the New Testament understands that may, that's salvation. God has forgiven you. This chapter isn't about forgiveness primarily, but Abraham's considered a friend of God. Clearly someone who has many blessings, somebody close to God. That's salvation. What does Abraham do in chapter 15? I'm hoping you remember. That's why I'm giving you this pause. Verse 5, he says, God says to him, Look towards heaven. Number the stars if you are able to number them. Then he said, So shall your offspring be. And he believed the Lord and counted it to him as righteousness. Abraham can't do anything. That's the point. That's why faith is saved for that verse. Because there's nothing you can do. All he could do is believe what God said. Believe the impossible. And yet, 
Abraham is also the paradigm. In Genesis, turn to 26. I just mentioned the first time a word shows up is important. Genesis 26, verse 4. This is God talking to Isaac. He's promising him, I'll do the things I promised to Abraham. I will multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven. Give to your offspring all of these lands. And in your offspring, all the nations of the earth will be blessed because Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my star charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. This is the first place any of those words show up. Commandments, statutes, laws, charge. Those are all hugely important words in the law. They're all, if you keep the law, that's how you do it. Moses tells Israel, these are the things you do. You keep the commandments, you keep the charge, you keep the, commandment, the statutes, you keep my um, laws. Abraham is the paradigm of the faithful Israelite, and you know because he's the, he keeps all God's laws. Now, there was no law at the time, but what it means is he loved God with his whole heart. He, he didn't even withhold his only son. So let's look at these two chapters. We're going to go to Romans 4, then we'll go to James 2. We'll, have, we'll see two angles on faith. They're both looking at Abraham's faith. On the one hand, we have to understand that faith, faith is not doing stuff. It's just believing what God has said. On the other hand, there is a fake faith. The Bible doesn't talk about fake faith because raise your hand if you have fake faith. Nobody thinks they have fake faith. So the Bible doesn't talk about it much. We don't think we have fake faith. We think we have real faith and we're struggling. The Bible doesn't talk about fake faith. It talks about dead faith. Abraham has real faith. Real faith saves, but there is a faith that doesn't save. There's a, you know, Satan believes. You ever thought about that? Does Satan believe in his heart that God raised Jesus from the dead? I should hope so. I don't think Satan has short-term memory loss. I mean, Satan was there. It was the most important thing going on in the world. Satan knew it. That's why he's tempting Jesus in the wilderness. Satan's going into Judas. He's making it all happen. Jesus raised from the dead. I don't think Satan was off on vacation. He remembers. He knows. In James it says, even the demons believe and they tremble. That kind of faith doesn't save you. It's not just knowing the facts. So, Romans 4. See what Paul says about faith. Romans 4, verse 1. What then shall we say was gained by Abraham our forefather according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he had something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Now to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. And to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. Just as David also speaks of the one to whom God counts righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven, whose sins are covered, Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. Paul wants us to understand that no one is saved because they do a bunch of good stuff. Abraham wasn't saved because he did a bunch of good stuff. He wasn't justified before God because of anything he did. He did lots of stuff and God didn't say at that time he's justified. It was because of his faith. Paul goes on to illustrate this for us, to demonstrate what faith is. Look at verse 17. As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations in the presence of God in whom he believes. He's bringing this up to point out we're children of Abraham, that we're heirs of the world. If Abraham's the father of nations, that implies he has authority over them. So he's the heir of them. And you as children of Abraham are heirs of the entire world. In hope, he believed against hope that he should become the father of many nations as he had been told, so shall your offspring be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead since he was about a hundred years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. Barrenness in the Bible is often linked to death. 
We just read Hannah's song recently. You remember God gave her a child and answered her prayer? And in the center of that song, she says, the Lord kills and the Lord brings to life. He brings down to Sheol and he raises up. What's she talking about? I was barren and now I've born a child. Describing it metaphorically. And Abraham, Paul says, is as good as dead. Do you see where he's going? Abraham had faith that God could give life to the dead. Abraham throughout the Old Testament is a paradigm of faith. When he offered up his son, he did it because he believed God would raise his son from the dead. It was three days journey. For three days, his son is as good as dead. And on the third day, he believed God could bring life to the dead. When he lifted up the knife. Because God had said, through Isaac, your seed shall be named. And I will multiply you as the stars of the heaven. He believed God will give me offspring through Isaac. So Isaac can't stay dead. He absolutely believed on that third day God could raise the dead. What do we believe? That God can give life. He raised Jesus on the third day. So Abraham is set up way back then as a paradigm for us. We're not saved because we do a bunch of good stuff. In fact, as Paul goes on through Romans, well, we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. You really want to prove it? If you could be saved by doing good stuff, why did Israel reject God? They had the law. They did the most good stuff. They were better than all the other nations as far as doing what God said went. God didn't give them salvation because they did a good job. Because then he, as soon as he gives salvation to the Jews, he says to the Jew first and then to the Greek. What did the Greek do? Nothing. They hated me. They hated Abraham. They hated my people. They killed us a bunch of times. And now I'm giving them salvation. Well, why? Because it's not based on what you did. It's based on I'm God and I'm merciful. They were, well, we were yet enemies. God reconciled us. To prove it wasn't, it's not based on what you do. It's based on you putting your faith in the God who can give life to the dead. And as Paul goes on in chapter 10, he says, all who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. If you believe in your heart, if you, if you call Jesus Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. All who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. There's two sides to that. On the one hand, you have to believe that God can do the impossible. You could be, have to believe in things you can't see. He created the universe in six days. How do you know? Were you there? No. Well, who was? Well, no one, actually. He created us on the sixth day. Well, how are we supposed to believe that? Believe that God can give life to the dead. He can create everything out of nothing. But you also have to call him Lord. So let's turn to James. How are we doing for time? I can't tell. We're okay. We're okay. James chapter 2. James is dealing with a different issue. Paul wants to make clear, you're not saved by what you do. You'll never be good enough. And God's willing to save wicked people. Jesus says, I came to save, I came to call not the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Paul says elsewhere, this saying is trustworthy, deserving of full acceptance. Jesus Christ came into this world to save sinners, of whom I'm the foremost. He didn't save you and start a work so that you could finish it on your own. It's his work from beginning to end. We look to him coming at his return to raise us from the dead. But James is dealing with something else. Look at verse 14 of chapter 2 in James. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, be warm and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Do you see what he did there? It's like if somebody comes to our church, I need help, and we say, oh yeah, man, you do. God bless you, man. Hey, hey everybody gather around. Let's put our hands on this man. God bless you. He's like, I'm, st I'm literally going to die in 10 minutes. I'm starving. Do you have any food? God bless you, man. <laughs> You're pretending you care about him. 
But when you don't help them, you show that you don't actually care, right? And so it is if we don't have works. We say we believe in God. Oh yeah, God raised the dead. God says to Adam, on the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. Did Adam believe that? I don't know, maybe if you asked him. Do you think God will kill you? Oh yeah, yeah, totally. <laughs> if you believe it, you wouldn't do that, would you? If you believe that God saved you, if you believe that he's saving you from your sin, that sin leads to death, he says it leads to shame. It kills you. It destroys your relationships. God hates it for a reason. That God loves you and he wants what's good for you. And you keep going in sin. You believe that Jesus was willing to die a violent death on a cross for your sin. And you keep sinning? You just keep living like it doesn't matter? What kind of faith is that? It's a fake faith, isn't it? Jesus said, if anyone is not willing to pick up his cross and follow me, he's not worthy of me. Now, that doesn't mean that every Christian has to die to be saved. I mean, most Christians do die eventually, but it doesn't mean we all have to be violently murdered. But the faith that saves is the faith that's willing to follow Jesus wherever he takes us. It's a faith that is willing to do whatever he says. Jesus says, if you love me, you will obey my commandments. He doesn't say, you have to obey this many commandments to be saved. He doesn't say, if you mess up this many times, I'll hate you. But he does say, if you love me, you'll obey my commandments. And we love him because he first loved us. So if you don't love him, if you don't obey his commandments, do you really believe he first loved you? There's a faith that's real, and there's a faith that faith that's fake and if you try to be saved either through we'll call them legalism or antinomianism either by working really hard or just trusting that it doesn't matter what you do you can miss faith that's the danger we all have struggles we, you know I sometimes lean towards legalism I just want to try really hard I feel like it'll make God happy sometimes I lean towards this one and I think oh it doesn't really matter there's leaning, but then there's trusting it for salvation. Jesus is the one who saves you. God saves you because he loves you. If you get too distracted, you can miss that. Verse 18. Someone will say, you have faith, but I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one. That's the Shema for you scholars over there. You do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works, and his faith was completed by his works. And the scripture was fulfilled that said, Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness, and he was called a friend of God. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. You see, that scripture was fulfilled. Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. But if Abraham, God said, offer up your son, your only son, whom you love, if Abraham said, no, I can't do that, because then he'd be dead. And how would the promise be fulfilled? It wouldn't be true, would it? Abraham believed God. His faith was completed by his works. God tells Noah to build an ark. How saved would he be if he didn't build the ark? Obviously, he's saved because he has faith. He believed God. How saved would he be if he built half an ark? Three quarters of an ark. Just enough, but he didn't put the floorboards in. There's a faith that saves and there's a faith that doesn't. And the faith that saves is the faith that when you recognize God loves you, you love him for it and you obey him. You're not saved by this much obedience or that much obedience. 
But the faith that saves is a faith that obeys. A dead faith. I mean, it's cool. There's a sense you, if you believe these things happen, well, you're not stupid. You're in the Satan camp. Satan's not stupid either, but it doesn't do much for you in the end. I don't know where all of you are at with this, but there's always a danger. Jesus tells us people will slip into the church and try to lead us astray. And throughout church history, this issue of faith and works has been one that people have been led astray on many times. It's one of the easiest ways we can go astray. And so I hope this is a helpful reminder for all of us. We're saved by Jesus. We're saved by God's work, sending his son to save us. There's nothing you can do to add to that. I heard the illustration once. Trying to be saved by works is like getting on an elevator and bringing a ladder with you. The ladder doesn't help. You know, whatever you bring to the table, God is the one saving you. He is the one working in you. And he is the one who will carry out that work to completion. But we do have to ask ourselves from time to time, are we trusting in God? Do we have the faith that saves? Are we willing to pick up our cross and follow him? And we have to ask that of others because if you save someone from their sin, if you pull someone out of a rough time, James says you save them from a multitude of errors. You cover a multitude of sin. So even if the sounds are relevant to you, it's not irrelevant to somebody. I've had many friends who have asked me so many times about these things and we keep coming back to it. So let's pray together that God would give us wisdom to look at our own hearts, to know where we're at, and that he would give us the strength to stand when the Son of Man comes. You know, that'll take faith. To have faith, even when it looks, everything's to the contrary, that God will keep his word. Have faith that he loves us. Lord, I thank you that you showed your love for us in this, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died to save us. That while we were your enemies, we were reconciled to you. How much more now that we have been reconciled, will we not also be saved by your love, by your work in our hearts? Lord, some of us might lack confidence. Maybe we put our confidence in what we do. Maybe we're not sure you love us. I don't know where we're at. I know I've struggled with such questions many times. But Lord, I ask that you would show us from your word as we look at the cross, that you love us. Give us the faith that endures to the end. Strengthen us so that we can stand through whatever comes our way. Lord, we know that things will come. Give us the strength to endure them all, to endure them with a joy that is a testimony to the world of your goodness in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.